We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining in for the uh, April installment of our uh, Pathways uh, Awardees Scientific Updates. We have two terrific uh, speakers today uh, talking about very interesting topics. And uh, I'm gonna make, I have one announcement, which is uh, in a previous session, I asked that Pathway winners please share uh, publications that you've generated during the time of your Pathway Award. We got a weak response to that. So I'm broadcasting the request again. Um, uh, and hopefully you'll, you'll hear me this time. I think it just would be very helpful to disseminate publications that have been generated by this program, not only amongst uh, the, the group that joins these sessions, but also as a resource for ADA staff to have to, to demonstrate uh, the great science that's uh, occurred as a result of the of this program. So please do send in uh, uh, exemplar publications from this program to Kylie and I, and uh, we will distribute to other members of the consortium here and, and also keep those uh, papers as references for uh, hopefully going out and getting more funding for the program in the future. All right, with no further ado then, um, our first speaker is uh, Celine Riera. She's at the uh, Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Uh, she is uh, an initiator award winner, and she's gonna tell us about sensory tuning of energy balance lessons from animal models. Uh, Celine, please take it away. Thank you so much, Chris, for the kind introduction. I hope everyone can hear me okay. So I'm going to tell you about the work that has been ongoing in my lab um, since it opened um, about four years ago. And uh, most of this work has been enabled by the Pathway Award, I have to say. So I'm very thankful for the opportunity to, to um, have received this award. So I, um, I am trained in sensory physiology and my lab interest is in understanding how sensory information is perceived by the nervous system through uh, peripheral nerves and the brain in order to regulate energy homeostasis. And for instance, uh, we focus on olfactory and thermosensory neurons and we aim at understanding how they are integrated um, by the nervous system to modulate thermogenesis and autonomic output. So we know very well that uh, internal stimuli such as hormones have a very dramatic effect on uh, physiology uh, by informing about the nutritional status, but we know very little about how sensory information is also integrated. And we in the lab aim at understanding how this functioning sensory system um, can have profound effect on homeostasis and eventually lead to uh, potential uh, metabolic dysfunction such as obesity and diabetes. So one of these um, sensory stimuli that we study are the thermosensory neurons and um, I'm going to talk about cold exposure. As you all well know, cold exposure is the most powerful physiological stimulus to modulate adaptive thermogenesis. And as it is illustrated in this um, pioneering study here, when uh, individuals are placed in uh, mild cold, this leads to a dramatic increase in brown fat activity. And similarly, uh, this works uh, as well as in humans as in mice, uh, prolonged cooling has a very beneficial effect on thermogenic adipocytes. So for instance, it leads to uh, expansion of brown fat and the browning of the subcutaneous fat pad. There has been a lot of enthusiasm about uh, cooling in humans as short-term acclimatization studies have been proving some sensitivity in diabetic patients. Yet um, in humans, there is a big heterogeneity in the thermogenic response um, as for example, in obesity and diabetes not all individuals have brown fat and are able to respond. So we heard a very interesting talk a couple of months ago by Paul Cohen about the heterogeneity of brown fat. So understanding how cooling work is very important, obviously for therapeutic reasons, um, yet um, 
yet it's difficult to implement cooling, right? Um, and we need to understand how it works in order to, to aim at designing some cold mimetics, which would have beneficial effect on thermogenic adipocytes without having detrimental effect uh, on cardiovascular function, as it is the case actually for certain uh, adrenergic molecule agonists. So we do understand how um, cooling is integrating into the brain. So for instance, it is integrating in the hypothalamus in the preoptic area, where um, it leads to uh, activation of soma somatic and sympathetic responses, somatic being the shivering in the case of more extreme cooling and sympathetic being uh, the response of these thermogenic adipocytes as well as, as vasoconstriction which leads to a reduction of heat loss by lowering the blood flow in the body. And all of this is very important because it controls uh, core temperature. And uh, the ultimate goal is to maintain core temperature constant, no matter what the outside environment looks like. Yet, we do not fully understand how the sensory perception of cooling uh, works in this phenomenon. So, are these sensory inputs um, actually required for the initiation and the maintenance of thermogenic responses? So in other words, is sensing cold sufficient to uh, induce thermogenesis um, versus um, having the whole body um, being actually cold? So this is important because if the sensation of cold can uh, stimulate thermogenesis, then um, it leads to a whole avenue of other potential therapeutic targets, which would uh, mimic cooling without actually um, requiring to cool the body. So the thermosensory neurons that detect cooling in the skin um, have, in common, have in common the expression of thermosensory uh, transient receptor potential ion channels. And those neurons um, arise from the dorsal ganglia and express uh, various trip channels. So for instance, we have trip V1, which is a heat sensor. Lean, Lean, excuse me. Yes. Uh, do you, do you, we're still on your title slide. So I'm not sure that your slides are advancing. And thank you for, to Gene Schaefer for pointing that out. Oh no, <laughs> that's really bad. Yeah. Um, no, you should not be on my title slide. That's there is a problem here. Let me see. Okay. Can you see this new slide? Yes. yes. Should I start over? <laughs> no, no. I think we were listening. Please go ahead. All right. So. Um, All right. All right. Can you see my new slide? Yes. All right. So there are various uh, trip channels that sense temperature. So we have trip V1, which detects uh, extreme heat, trip M8, which detects um, cooling, so mild cold um, below 26 degrees, and trip A1, which um, um, presumably detects more noxious cold. However, this one. Um, this one may not necessarily sense cold in humans because it appears that it, it could potentially detect uh, extreme heat. So there is some controversial uh, findings regarding the involvement of trip A1 in cooling. And these uh, sensory nerves are uh, embedded in the skin where they detect temperature changes and um, send this information to the spinal cord, which is then transmitted to the parabrachial nucleus and then the preoptic area in the brain, which has this impact on autonomic function. So um, a few years ago, uh, when I started to ask about um, the potential role of trip channels and energy metabolism, um, and I was a postdoc in Andy Dillon's lab, we uh, started to study trip V1 in energy metabolism and found that removal of this, of this receptor led to a um, pretty dramatic increase in energy expenditure in the mice. And because we had found in C. elegans that removal of uh, the orthologs 
of the trip Vs led to increased lifespan. We also checked for longevity and we found that mice which lacked trip V1 had a dramatic increase in lifespan compared to um, controls. And not only they had increased lifespan, but they also had increase in health span as a cancer incidence was uh, quite dramatically reduced. So we did not fully understood, understand the connection between trib one and energy metabolism, but uh, one of the hypotheses that we had was perhaps that loss of trib one was able to modulate the ability to sense cooling and generate thermogenic responses. So um, we could have studied uh, the trib one knockout mice, but instead, um, we decided that uh, we wanted to have very specific um, inhibition of these neurons in the periphery because tribulon is also expressed in the brain. And um, a few years ago, um, it was discovered that a subset of these tribulon sensory neurons actually was exerting tonic inhibition on the tripamate fibers which detect cooling. So when you remove these uh, tribulon sensory neurons, uh, that leads to um, increase in the responses to cooling stimuli. And um, only by removing the peptidergic subgroup of these neurons, um, this response was observed. So in my lab, we decided to use this strategy to specifically inactivate these uh, tribulant CGRP neurons uh, using Crelox uh, recombination. So we used, um, uh, Advilin Cree that was crossed with diphtheratoxin receptor expressing mice under the CGRP uh, promoter. And the reason for using these two promoters was to restrict our ablation to the periphery and not have any kind of CGRP ablation in the brain. Uh, mostly because CGRP in the brain has pretty dramatic effect on feeding. Um, that's work done by Richard Pameters and others showing that um, these CGRP neurons, uh, when activated, lead to a dramatic inhibition of feeding. So in our case, uh, we uh, were able to restrict our expression to these peripheral neurons. We observed like ablation in the dorsal ganglia of these uh, CGRP neurons. And uh, we asked whether uh, removal of these neurons was somehow perturba perturbating the responses to cooling. So um, when we inject ethylene, which is a super cooling agent, uh, that's both trip uh, M8 and trip A1, trip A1 agonist. So it's uh, really um, activating all the cold sensory uh, receptors. There is a strong autonomic response to cooling as shown by tail vasoconstriction here um, in wild type and CGRP uh, heterozygotes. And quite remarkably, only in the CGRP uh, knockout mice, we observed this strong increase in that thermogenesis as measured by thermal camera, really showing that removing these neurons increases the autonomic responses to cooling. So remarkably, um, at room temperature, these mice uh, also presented increased tail vasoconstriction, as you can see here, uh, which could be uh, ablated, which could be um, uh, going back to, which went back to normal when the mice were placed at thermal neutrality. What was really interesting to us is that um, this mice felt more, felt more cold at room temperature, um, but had uh, the ability to maintain their core temperature just like wild type mice, basically at 22 degrees and also uh, in a cold stress. So we then ask whether removal of these neurons could prevent uh, diet-induced obesity by increasing thermogenic responses. So we challenge these mice with high-fat diets. And what we observe is that um, these animals were not gaining as much fat as their wild type uh, litter mates, which were becoming obviously obese on diet induced obesity. And uh, these animals presented increased energy expenditure. But importantly, and again to show that our effects were restricted to the periphery, there was no change in food intake in these mice. 
So um, the responses of brown fat were also um, um, shown to be uh, quite different on high fat diet in these mice. So as expected, the wild type uh, litter mates gained weight and uh, presented lipid vacuoles in their brown fats, but the CGRP ablated mice did not. And when we measure mitochondrial respiration in these mice um, using brown fat biopsies, we observed a higher oxygen consumption rate in these uh, animals on high fat diet. And that was accompanied by obviously an increase in brown fat um, temperature as measured by thermal imaging in these animals, which was also maintained at 28 degrees, um, potentially because of the additive effect of diet induced thermogenesis in these mice. So we then asked whether these mice had increased beta-3 adrenergic responsiveness. And um, obviously, uh, just a quick uh, reminder of the beta-3 adrenergic signaling, uh, which leads to, um, uh, upon norepinephrine, uh, cold leads to norepinephrine release by the sympathetic nerves, which activate these beta-3 adrenergic receptors in adipose tissue. Um, leading to lipolysis of triglycerides and um, fatty acid utilization in the mitochondria uh, through uncoupling of the mitochondria, uh, which produce heat. So when we injected CL, which is uh, CL316243, which activates beta-3 adrenergic receptor, we observed this expected burst in uh, oxygen consumption in the wild-time mice. But in our CGRP ablating mice, we saw a further increase um, in these animals, which is um, shown here in the hours following CL injection. And when we place animal on high fat diet, we observed that obviously they had increased oxygen consumption to start with, and injection of CL also led to a more minor increase in oxygen consumption. So because these mice are lean and um, were responsive to, further responsive to CL, we ask whether, um, they had increased lipolysis in white adipose tissue. So as you can see, the white adipose tissue of the wild type mice uh, shows um, larger adipocytes, uh, seems like there is more inflammation in this fat, whereas in the CGRP ablating mice, the adipocytes are much smaller and uh, the adipose tissue overall looks more healthy. So we perform ex vivo lipolysis and we observe that um, upon isoproteranol injection, which also activate adrenergic receptors, there was a gain of function in the CGRP ablated mice compared to uh, the wild type. And quite remarkably, um, gene expression of uh, fatty, as fatty acid oxidation genes were um, increased in these animals. And we did observe an increase in the transcription of adrenergic receptor three, uh, specifically in the gonadal fat pad of the mice uh, compared to the wild type, which was not significantly different from uh, post-CL injection, which also leads to, again, um, in transcription in this gene in adipose tissue. And that was very specific to the white fat, where we really saw a strong effect on lipolysis in white fat in these mice. So one of the questions that we had uh, was to also understand whether these neurons were um, detecting changes in temperature in the skin um, or whether they could also detect changes in temperature directly in adipose tissue. So um, we teamed up with Paul Cohen and the Rockefeller to um, ask this question and examine the presence of these neurons in adipose tissue. So in the white fat and the subcutaneous fat, we saw very little or no uh, presence of these neurons. Um, however, we did see them quite well in the brown adipose tissue. So we were very excited about uh, their presence there because they not only follow uh, blood vessels, but they're also present in the parenchyma. So we decided to ablate these neurons specifically in, specifically in the brown fat using uh, the same genetic model that we have, but this time by injecting diphtheria toxin um, through microinjection in the brown adipose tissue. And 
we did not see any particular phenotype in these mice. So uh, on high fat diet, they gain as much weight as the litter mate. They were um, equally fat. They did not have increase in oxygen consumption or any kind of tail vasoconstriction at room temperature or brown fat thermogenesis. So it really seems that um, these neurons are not required in brown fat for detecting uh, changes in temperature, but they're most likely are acting in the skin. And unfortunately, we cannot really perform the same kind of uh, analysis in the skin because it's really hard to ablate the neurons specifically there. So um, overall, we think that um, these sensory neurons which express CGRP and 3V1 um, are um, acting as um, inhibitors of, of cooling and by removing them, um, the animals feel more cold and this leads to autonom autonomic responses to cooling, cooling which are further engaged and um, promote increased energy expenditure on high fat diet. And um, consequence, consequently, we see an increase in vasoconstriction and an increase in uh, brown fat fuel burning and white liposis. So um, as opposite to our data, which exacerbate uh, cooling responses, the study, um, which was published a couple of years ago, showed by mutating trip M8, so removing this cold sensory receptor, um, the animals actually become obese on high fat diet. They have a decrease in energy expenditure and they are not able to regulate their temperature when challenged with cooling. So it's sort of a, um, opposite phenotype to what we observed. So based on our findings, we're now very interesting to understand um, if the ability to sense cooling can be linked to uh, the cold induced thermogenic capacity of the mice. So it is well known that uh, various mouse models are, um, mouse strains are uh, gaining weight quite differently on high fat diet and show different responses when it comes to their glucose tolerance or insulin sensitivity. With the C57 black 6 strain um, that we all study um, showing a pretty strong uh, obesity phenotype, yet uh, the 129 strain here gains even more weight and similarly the DBA2. Whereas the BALPC and the FVB strain um, are more uh, resistant to weight gain. So um, we recently started to look at that and this, those are very preliminary data, but um, I wanted to include them in this talk. Um, they have been generated by my new grad student, Edward, in the lab. So we obtained these five mice strains and um, monitor them on normal show. You can see that they don't necessarily um, have different body weights. They actually have pretty similar body weights um, at the point that we are now. And when we inject these mice with insulin, which is the super cooling agent, we observe a burst in oxygen consumption in the mice uh, through indirect calorimetry. And as you can uh, appreciate, the two strains which are resistant to diet induced obesity show the strongest response to insulin. Whereas um, the two most obese strains, this 129 and DBA strain, have very small response to insulin. And when it comes to thermosensory response to cold, quite remarkably, you can see here that this FVB strain um, is more sensitive to cooling. So this is on a hot plate. This is a behavior test where the mouse um, is placed on a cold hot plate where we adjust the temperature between 5 to 55 degrees and we measure the withdrawal latency for the mice to withdraw uh, its pose. And you can see that the FVB strain uh, is quite sensitive to the cold effects of the, of the plate, but has no thermosensory uh, difference compared to the black six strain. Similarly, the autonomic responses to insulin, which is the tail vasoconstriction and the bad thermogenesis appear to be much higher in the bulb C and this FVB strains compared to the other strains, which um, in the case of bad thermogenesis, you can see that the three strains that um, are prone to obesity have no response. So uh, we think there is a correlation there, um, which we cannot fully make at the moment because we have to put the, this mice on high fat diet. 
in order to see um, this correlation. But it appears to be there based on published studies. So to conclude on what I've shown so far, um, removal of the CGRP neurons enhances autonomic responses to cooling. It increases energy expenditure, uh, promoting resistance to weight gain on high fat diets. Um, it appears to recruit bat mitochondrial respiration and white lipolysis uh, through upregulation. Uh, we lost you, at least I did, Celine. Are, are others, did others also lose the, the audio? Yes. 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 Oh boy. <laughs> Looks like she froze. I'm not ADRP3. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you, yes. <laughs> um, you so I was just at the conclusion. Um, let me see if I can just share quickly. It's my last slide. Um, I was just saying that the autonomic responses to the cooling agent insulin correlate with resistance to, di resistance to diet induced obesity, as we have seen so far. Okay. And I want to thank everybody that was uh, involved in these studies in my lab, uh, Edward and Harshita and Kuldeep, who um, were um, first author on this uh, paper that we recently had, as well as other members of the lab um, which have been involved and helped. Uh, I want to thank our collaborators, uh, Paul Cohen, and uh, our funding sources, uh, mostly the Pathway uh, Award as well as the Diabetes uh, Research Center from UCSD for um, helping us um, make those studies reality. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm really sorry we had so many technical issues. <laughs> I hope uh, you still managed to understand what I was trying to say. No, I th it was very clear. Uh, don't worry, uh, and, and very elegant. Thank you for the talk. Um, Alan Saltiel has a question. Celine looks like the big effect of CGRP neuron de depletion is on ADRB3 levels. ADRB3 is downregulated in obesity, driven mainly by TNF and possibly insulin. Does ARDB3 go up before prevention of weight gain? And is there any effect on inflammation or fasting insulin levels in the mice prior to weight loss? So we did not see ADRB3 go up before high fat diet. We only saw that effect um, when the mice were on high fat diet. Um, in terms of inflammation, we saw decreased inflammation in adipose tissue. I didn't have um, enough time to include all, all the data with the mice, um, but there was reduced um, macrophage infiltration, reduced cytokines, and any effect. And the fasting insulin levels, um, we did not see any difference. So that was quite interesting to us. Um, it appears that most of the effect we saw, um, so on normal show, we didn't see any difference. On high fat diet, we saw that they had improved insulin sensitivity, um, which was mostly because they were resistant to high fat diet, but there was no prior effect on insulin sensitivity on normal show. Uh, Mike Stitzel, the strain uh, uh, asks, the strain differences are quite interesting and striking. Do you have any evidence of coding mutations in your gene of interest or any potential changes in expression between strains, other related genes, any thought about undertaking genetic mapping? Yeah, so I um, think this is where this is going to go. Um, so we want to know how the cold sensory responses are integrated into the brain. So now we're looking at the proptic area of the hypothalamus to see whether um, the neural circuits are um, working similarly in those strains, because it appears that the sensory responses are different. So there could be um, either SNPs on the trip channels, which uh, lead to different responses to, to hold, or potentially different gene expression of these trip channels, we don't really know. So there's a lot of things that we can explore, that's for sure. But first we want to understand the neural circuits before going into uh, the genetics. And the good thing about these trains is that um, a lot of the genetics is known, so it's quite easy for us to go 
after the genus of interest and try to see whether there are potential mutations that may explain the differences that we see. And uh, maybe a last question for me. Um, you talked about uh, lipolysis, activation of lipolysis and genes of fatty acid oxidation being a metabolic signature of some of your manipulations. Have you looked have you looked more broadly at other metabolic pathways? And of course, I'm thinking about branched chain amino acids with the work of Shingo Kajimura uh, 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 suggesting that BCAA catabolism is important for brown fat thermogenesis in a recent, recent Nature paper. Uh, any thoughts about that? We have not, and this is very interesting and something that could definitely be done. So um, it'd be great to look at that. We, we just had a quick, uh, glance at uh, mitochondrial respiration in brown fats on high fat diet, but we didn't really explore what type of substrates or um, those mitochondria we're using. And that would be really interesting to investigate. Fantastic. All right, Celine, I want to thank you for a wonderful uh, seminar, even with technical issues. It was still very clear. I want to <laughs> promise you that, okay? All right, we're going to move on then uh, to our second speaker, Sarah Stanley. Uh, from the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, not to be confused with Cedar Sinai, we're talking different coast here. Uh, Sarah received an accelerator award um, in 2017, and she's going to tell us about CNS control of glucose metabolism. Sarah, please. Can you hear me now? So um, I want to say thank you so much to the ADA for the funding and these are my disclosures. I'm gonna tell you about a little of our work that we've been doing to understand neural control of glucose metabolism. And as diabetes researchers, we're used to thinking about the consequences of obesity and hyperglycemia, but for most species and for most of human history, the major problem has been a lack of food and the risk of hypoglycemia. And the reason that this is a huge problem is because glucose is the major fuel for the brain. And the brain consumes about 60 to 70% of whole body glucose in the resting state. You can see here, major uptake in the CNS um, in the PET scan. So the effects of hypoglycemia are very rapid and severe, and there have been multiple mechanisms that have evolved to try and avoid hypoglycemia. And many of these involve CNS circuits. So I'm just going to briefly summarize what we know about CNS control of glucose metabolism. Um, we know, for example, that there are specialized neurons that act as glucose sensors, and these are very similar to the glucose sensing cells in the pancreas. Some of them are similar to beta cells and are uh, activated by high glucose, and these are known as glucose excited neurons, whereas others are, correspond to alpha cells and are activated by low glucose and are known as glucose inhibited neurons. And over many years, there have been studies to look at the distribution of these glucose sensing neurons. And we know that they're widely distributed throughout the CNS, but particularly concentrated in the hypothalamus and brainstem. And uh, summarizing multiple years and studies, about 10 to 15% of neurons within the hypothalamic nuclei are glucose sensing, glucose excited or glucose inhibited. Although we don't know the connections of the individual glucose sensing populations, we do know that the areas where they're found connect directly and indirectly to autonomic outflow tracts. So this includes the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, which controls parasympathetic efferents, and the IML, which controls sympathetic efferents. And numerous studies over many decades have shown that the autonomic nervous system is involved in glucose regulation. And to summarize a vast body of literature, basically the parasympathetic nervous system, which is particularly activated during the fed state, increases insulin release whilst the sympathetic nervous system, which is active in hypoglycemia and fasting, increases glucagon and suppresses insulin and may regulate insulin sensitivity. So although we do know that the CNS is involved in glucose metabolism, there's still a lot of work to be done to identify the neural populations that regulate glucose, map their circuits and understand their physiological roles. And with the ADA Pathway Award, we've become very interested in the CNS circuits that respond to stress. We know that both internal and external stresses regulate behavior and metabolism. 
Some of the responses are switching on behaviors such as escape, whilst others are reducing behaviors that are already ongoing, inhibiting feeding, for example. And anybody who's worked with animals or even patients know that stress uh, rapidly increases blood glucose. What's interesting is that the responses are very highly conserved across species and probably offer a survival advantage. And we know that either inadequate or exaggerated responses are detrimental. So for example, stress hypoglycemia in hospitalized patients increases morbidity and mortality and very uh, aggressive control of the hypoglycemia actually doesn't seem to be helpful and can even be detrimental. We also know that there's a two-way interaction between diabetes and anxiety or chronic stress. And perhaps what's most intriguing to me is the fact that there's evidence that there seems to be separation in the circuits that regulate the behavioral and the metabolic responses to stress. So we've become interested in the role of a small area in the, uh, the temporal lobe, the medial amygdala, in the metabolic response to stress. We know that it's activated by stresses. We also know that it's involved in metabolic regulation. Previous studies have shown that it's involved in the feeding response and also glucose homeostasis. And there's behavioral studies which suggest that it plays a role in aggression and defensive behaviors. So first of all, we wanted to know whether activating the medial amygdala, which we know is switched on by stress, could mimic any of the behavioral or metabolic responses. And to do this, we used a viral technique. We injected AAV8 with a neural promoter driving the activating drug um, HM3DQ. And the control mice were treated with a neuronal promoter driving M-Cherry. We then wait for weeks and administer CNO to activate just the neurons in the medial amygdala and assess the response to feeding, blood glucose, and anxiety-like behaviors. And when we switch on the medial amygdala neurons, what we found was that we could very rapidly inhibit food intake. On the x-axis is the time after the CNO injection, so the time after the initial activation of the neurons, and on the y-axis is the chow eaten in grams. And this is in overnight fasted males and females. And as you can see in the first hour after CNO administration, there's a significant decrease in food intake. And interestingly, what we found was that this was also true if we gave them a very palatable diet, such as peanut butter, and also in fed animals, fed a palatable diet. So this was interesting to us because it wasn't quite typical of the usual homeostatic control of feeding that we see. We then went on to look at the glycemic response to activating medial amygdala neurons and found that it was significantly elevated. But what was interesting was that neither plasma insulin nor plasma glucagon seemed to be dramatically affected, suggesting that it wasn't um, a consequence of pancreatic hormone release. We also did a battery of tests to look at anxiety-like behaviors. These include the examination in the elevated plus maze, the light dot box, and the open field arena. And we could see no difference in the behaviors between mice with the control virus or ones where we we're activating the medial amygdala. And finally, we looked at plasma corticosterone, and again, could see no difference between the two groups. So this suggests that while stress activates numerous brain regions um, and produces behavioral and metabolic effects, when we activate the medial amygdala, which we know is switched on in stressful situations, we only uh, reproduce a subpopulation of these um, reduced food intake and hyperglycemia. So we next wanted to determine what are the downstream sites where the neurons are projecting and which might be mediating these effects. So to do this, we wanted to map the major projections from the medial amygdala. And we did this using an AAV again, this time with um, an M-cherry tag synaptophysin, which is the synaptic protein. This was injected into the medial amygdala, um, where M-cherry is found uh, is the site of the synaptic connections from this brain region. And what you can see here is that there is quite intense M-cherry expression in the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, the ventromedial hypothalamus, and the lateral hypothalamus. So regions that have been um, implicated in glycemic control. But what we didn't know was whether or not these were activating or inhibitory projections, and that was our next question. So to assess this, we performed the same studies, but this time using a Cree-dependent synaptophysin M-cherry virus in mice which had um, Cree expression in inhibitory GABAergic neurons or in excitatory glutamatergic neurons. And what we found was that the major downstream projections were actually glutamatergic and were primarily to the BNST and to the ventromedial hypothalamus. So our next step was to try and assess the functional roles of these downstream projections. And we did this using a viral approach again. 
So in this case, we injected AAV retro expressing Cre either into the ventromedial hypothalamus or into the bed nucleus of the terminalis. And this virus is taken up by terminals in either the VMH or BNST and then transported back to the cell bodies where the Cre is expressed. And we then injected a Cre dependent construct into the medial amygdala expressing the activating dread. So this allows us to activate either the medial, mid, sorry, medial amygdala neurons projecting to the VMH or those projecting to the BNST. And when we performed these studies and um, stimulated the pathways with CNO, we first looked at blood glucose. And this is shown in this panel. The x-axis is time after CNO injection and the y-axis is blood glucose. The control group in all the panels is shown in gray. The activation of the MEA to BMH neurons is shown in red and the blue shows the activation of the MEA to BNST projection. And although blood glucose was slightly elevated, this didn't reach significance. So we then went on to uh, provide a challenge, in this case, a glucose challenge. And when we did so, we found that there was an increase, a significant increase in blood glucose when we activated the pathway from the MEA to the ventromedial hypothalamus. And that's shown in the area under the curve here. Interestingly, when we measured plasma insulin, and plasma glucagon, we didn't see any significant difference in the pathways where we were activating MEH BMH neurons. So this suggested that again, it wasn't an effect on pancreatic hormone release. So to see whether there was a difference in insulin sensitivity, we performed an insulin tolerance test. And this is shown here in this panel. Um, and as you can see, the initial slope between the groups doesn't appear to be different, suggesting there's no difference in insulin sensitivity but what we did find was that there was a more rapid response to recovery from hypoglycemia when we activated MEA to BMH neurons, suggesting that activating this pathway might improve the counter-regulatory response to hypoglycemia. When we looked at additional hormones, including corticosterone, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, we didn't see any effect in the MEA to BMH group, and in fact, the effects on the MEA to BNST group didn't quite reach significance. And so we didn't really have a, a mechanism for the increase in glucose production. So we went on to perform a pyruvate tolerance test. And in this case, we give an IP injection of pyruvate, which acts as a substrate for gluconeogenesis. And as you can see in this panel, when we do so, we have a much greater response in the blood glucose when we're activating the MEA to BMH pathway, suggesting that these neurons are actually increasing hepatic or uh, renal gluconeogenesis. We then went on to look at both feeding and anxiety behavior, and these are summarized in the panels. The top panels show the feeding response, and as you can see, there was no significant effect on food intake when we activate either of the neuronal pathways. And when we assess anxiety-like behavior in the open field test, which is in the lower panel, again, we can see no significant difference between the group. So what these studies show is that Whilst MEA activation has effects on both food intake and hyperglycemia, if we activate significant, uh, single pathways, in this case from the MEA to the VMH, we can only see effects on the hyperglycemia. And it appears that this pathway is actually regulating gluconeogenesis. So what we next wanted to do was to see whether this is required to maintain normal glucose control and also for the hyperglycemic response to stress. And we did so by ablating the pathway and again, we used a viral approach. In this case, we inject AAV retro into the VMH. It's taken up by the terminals in this area and transported back to the medial amygdala. And then we inject a Cre-dependent construct, which delivers diphtheria toxin and allows us to ablate just the neurons that project from the medial amygdala to the ventromedial hypothalamus. And when we do this, we find that there is a small but significant effect on um, fast fed blood glucose in these animals. And interestingly, we didn't see any effect on plasma insulin, and if anything, plasma glucagon was significantly increased, suggesting that there might be a compensatory response to the lower glucose. We then went on to do an insulin tolerance test, and as you can see here, there's no difference in sensitivity, which is in keeping with the activation response. But when we uh, inhibit this pathway, the recovery from hypoglycemia is blunted. So this suggests that this pathway may be involved in um, the counter-regulatory response to hypoglycemia. We didn't find any effect, whoops, lost my cursor. We didn't find any effect on um, GTT or pyruvate tolerance in these animals. 
So one caveat of this study is that we performed both the GTT and the pyruvate tolerance test relatively late after surgery and after ablation. And it's possible that the increase in glucagon that we see, which is compensating perhaps for the low blood glucose, may be masking effects in blood glucose during the GTT and PTT. In keeping with our activation studies, we really didn't see any effect on plasma corticosterone, epinephrine or epinephrine, nor epinephrine, and we didn't see any effect on plasma glycerol, suggesting that there weren't effects on lipolysis. In our next set of studies, we wanted to see whether ablating the circuit could actually have effects on the stress hypoglycemic response. And the answer was yes. So we used two forms of stress. The first was restraint. And as you can see in control animals, this produces a very robust increase in blood glucose. But when we ablate the pathway from the medial amygdala to the ventromedial hypothalamus, this is significantly blunted. The second form of stress was what was called a territorialized cage, where we placed the animals in a dirty cage that had been previously occupied by a male mouse. And this produces um, a less robust but still significant increase in blood glucose. And this response was blunted in the mice where there was ablation of the medial amygdala to BMH circuit. We then went on to look at anxiety-like behavior. And as we'd seen in the activation studies, we could really find no significant effect on anxiety-like behavior in the open field test. But then we wondered whether or not having um, a suboptimal or um, blunted response in terms of the glycemic response to stress might actually have effects downstream of um, stress, so behavior after a stressor. So in this case, what we did was we stressed the animals with restraint stress and then looked at their behavior in an open field. And when we did this in the control group, we found the expected increase in locomotion, which gradually declined. But in the animals where there was um, ablation of the MEA to BMH pathway, there was actually a significant decrease in the locomotor response after a stress. And what we're now beginning to assess is whether or not restoring the blood glucose response to stress might actually restore this um, locomotor response as well. We also looked at energy balance in these animals, and we didn't see any difference in body weight between the mice which had the ablation of the MEA BMH pathway, but we did see a slight but non-significant increase in food intake when they're on normal chow. So we challenged the mice by giving them a palatable diet. And when we did so, what we found was that food intake was actually significantly increased when we ablate this pathway and body weight was also significantly increased. Interestingly, although blood glucose was low, lower in the ablated group on normal chow, when we gave them the palatable diet, they still became hyperglycemic. And in fact, when you normalize for body weight, uh, the groups are entirely identical. We have now started to do some energy expenditure studies, and these are very provisional, but it looks like as well as the increase in intake, we may also be seeing an effect on energy expenditure. And it looks like there is a decrease, particularly in the light phase, though we don't see any difference in locomotion. So what these studies show you are that uh, ablating the medial amygdala to BMH pathway lowers blood glucose in fed animals. It also increases feeding and impairs the stress hypoglycemic response and interestingly may impair the behavioral responses after stress. So what we're now beginning to do is to look at the connection between this MEA VMH circuit and the periphery. So we have some uh, studies where we've been using retrograde tracing using pseudorabies virus, and we can show that there are projections from the MEA and VMH to the liver. We're also doing some functional studies to look at these peripheral circuits. We know that when we activate the MEA to BMH neurons, we see an increase in fast in brainstem regions which regulate sympathetic function. This includes the locus ceruleus and the rostroventrolateral medulla. And we are also now looking at the celiac ganglia to see whether or not FOS is increased in this um, ganglia, suggesting that there might be sympathetic activation there. And our hypothesis is that activation of this MEA VMH pathway might lead to upregulation of sympathetic outflow specifically to the liver. And when we have this, uh, this may regulate hepatic gluconeogenesis. And as you can see here, what we find in the liver is that there is an increase in G6P uh, relative gene expression, but not in PEPCK expression. And in fact, this mimics very closely the pattern that we see uh, when we stress animals and look at the gluconeogenic enzymes, uh, sorry, hormones in the liver. So to summarize this work, we've shown that the MEA is activated by stressful stimuli. Uh, we've shown it for power sting and restraint. 
we know that MEA activation is sufficient to increase blood glucose and suppress feeding. We've then shown that the major excitatory projections from the medial amygdala are to the BNST and the BMH. And what I didn't show you is that these regions are also activated by stress. When we activate the projection from the MEA to the BNST, we didn't see any effect on metabolism. But when we activate the one from the MEA to the BMH, it's sufficient to impair glucose tolerance, improve recovery from hypoglycemia, and increase gluconeogenesis. And this pathway appears to be necessary for the full hypoglycemic response to stress, and also for normal glycemic control, energy expenditure, and control of food intake. So we have ongoing studies where we're trying to um, look at the inputs to the medial amygdala neurons and also try and identify which of the neurons project to the VMH and what are the downstream targets of the MEA VMH projecting neurons. And as we move forward, we'd like to see whether or not this pathway has a role in the hypoglycemic response to, to chronic stress. So these are the amazing people in my lab and um, Kavya is the really fantastic grad student who's really worked on this most of the time. And I'd also like to thank our collaborators, both in uh, the Diabetes Institute at Sinai, elsewhere in Sinai, and at Rockefeller and Einstein, and of course the ADA for their support. Thank you. Thank you very much for a lovely presentation and uh, really exciting science. Um, Mike Schwartz has a question. Uh, did you look at the impact of disrupting the MEA VMN pathway on diabetic hyperglycemia, for example, induced by streptozoidosin? We haven't. No, that's one of the things that we have on our to-do list. I think that would be very exciting um, and may well show some phenotype that we haven't been able to see because we think there may be compensation with the, the change in, in insulin and glucose secretion. But I think that's a great idea. Yeah, that, that touches on something that I was wondering about. Uh, you you um, didn't think that any of your effects were mediated by insulin glucagon, but it looked to me in one slide like insulin was rising and glucagon was falling. Neither was significant in their own right, but it, was there a significant change in insulin glucagon ratio? Are you are you sure that there's no is are you sure there's no impact of the circuits that you're studying on islet hormone secretion? And we haven't looked at the ratio, but I will go back and check on that, actually. That's a good idea. Yep. Okay. Uh, here's another question. What type of stimuli regulate these cells? Are they glucose inhibited or glucose excited, particularly responsive to chronic periods of stress? So um, we're beginning to look at whether or not they also express glucose sensors, such as glucokinase or the glutes. Um, so far, they, our studies have shown that they don't seem to overlap necessarily or completely with um, known markers of glucose sensing cells. And when we do, um, when we use mice which have uh, the FOS promoter driving Cree and cross over to TD tomato mice to try and mark either glucose inhibited or glucose excited neurons and then stress, we don't see very good overlap between the populations. So it's possible that they may not be responding to to, G, to, to glucose, but responding to other metabolic stimuli. Um, and that's something that we'd really like to know, obviously. So yes, we, we have more work to do there to know what kind of neurons they are. All right, terrific. Um, any other questions? Open, opening the floor. Uh, you could just speak up if you something flashed to mind. This is, this is Mike Schwartz, if I could just... Uh... Sure. Make a comment. It, it actually pertains in, to some extent to both of our excellent presentations this morning. Um, and the point I would make is that, as Celine talked about, uh, primary sensory input related to body temperature, to the environmental temperature, is provided by sensory fibers that then transmit their information into the brain through the spinal cord and up into the hypothalamus. And then the hypothalamus is where thermoregulatory responses are coordinated in response to that changing afferent input. But the hypothalamic neurons that are involved in this integration response also express the same temperature sensing uh, channels that are expressed in the periphery. So, you have temperature sensitive neurons that are involved in the integration 
of the afferent information in the brain, you also have temperature sensing neurons in the periphery that are actually primarily responsible for transmitting thermal afferent information. So there's redundancy there is my point. And that the brain actually does not rely on sensing the temperature in the brain. It relies on, sen on the sensing the temperature in the periphery. In fact, the brain temperature doesn't really change very much normally. So, so, so we don't know exactly why there would be temperature sensing neurons in the hypothalamus because the temperature is not changing unless they're there as some kind of a backup in, in case of a calamity where the brain temperature is changing. And the reason I bring this up is that I think the analogy may be relevant to brain glucose sensing as well. We have peripheral glucose sensors that are positioned actually sense changes in the circulating glucose level and convey that information to the brain. But we also have neurons buried deep in the brain that have glucose sensing properties, as Sarah talked about. And the question is, the question is, where is the information that the brain is using to sense the circulating glucose level coming from? And I would argue that it's not coming from neurons that are buried deep in the brain because they don't have good access to the circulation. The peripheral, they're either in the periphery or in circumventricular organs like the median eminence or the area postrema, you would have the ability to sense the circulating glucose level with neurons that are in the brain, but you also have neurons in innervating the portal vein, for example, that have been shown to convey this information. So uh, in other words, it's possible that in the BMN or the medial amygdala, that there are glucose sensing neurons that comprise part of the circuit, but that doesn't mean that they're responding to changes of glucose in that brain area. They're part of a circuit that's wired into sensing responding to changing glucose levels, but probably the sensing of glucose in those brain areas per se is not a major driver of the activity of those neurons. I mean, just based on logical reasoning. So I just wanna throw that out there because it changes how you think about the role of brain glucose sensing, which has been studied over many decades and is still an area of confusion for this reason. Well, that made my brain overheat, but uh, either of our speakers uh, have a comment? Thank you, Mike. Um, I'll comment initially for the, the medial amygdala, which is, I, I agree with you completely. We know that it's connected to um, neurons which are outside the blood-brain barrier in the arcuate, uh, so it's probably receiving inputs from there. I don't know about whether it's connected to um, circumventricular organs in the brainstem, but that would certainly be something that we could look at. So if, if I can the last word. Yes, if I can comment on the thermosensory in the brain. So TRIV-V1 is in the hypothalamus and it appears to be involved in um, heat sensing in the hypothalamus to suppress um, feeding upon exercise, for instance. However, when it comes to trip ma the cooling pathway, it's not found in the brain. So it seems like the cooling is predominantly, predominantly working in the periphery for some reason. So I think this is really interesting. Very, very good point. All right, well, thank you to uh, our well, wonderful speakers today. Great job, uh, good discussion. Uh, thank you for the comments. And I'll just say that our next session is on Wednesday, May 5th at two o'clock. Our speakers will be Wolfgang Petty and Maureen Monaghan. And so uh, please plan on being there and please plan on participating vigorously as, we, as folks have been doing. So thank you very much and see you in a month. Take care, everyone.